seniors' health care in their home is a major theme in New Brunswick. We have systemic challenges to how we look after our aging population. Today's guest is Karen Lake. She is a senior home care specialist and care navigator. Her conversation takes us into many of the details about how to provide home health care, the systemic change that's needed that could also create many jobs, and the notion of using a snow globe as an image for how we need to turn the system upside down and turn it back up and watch the new pieces fall into place. There are other professions that probably would echo the same sentiment. I'm yeah. thinking of uh, you know, people that work in daycares mm -hmm. and the conversation around daycares in the 80s and the 90s and finally getting the ECE or Early Childhood yes. Education Certification process and getting past paying minimum wage mm -hmm. because these are children you're caring for. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, the, it echoes, it the, resonates. The coalition for pay equity in the province have been working tirelessly on that very exact same issue. They've been working on the education uh, issue for sure. And alongside of that, they're working on the women that are in caring professions as well, specifically mm -hmm. personal support workers. Mm -hmm. And they're, they've got a campaign going right now. There, there's a lot of momentum right now. Um, this Medivy issue has raised the issue of home care. Um, there have been other people, other advocates, activists, uh, uh, public personas who have been speaking about the importance of in-home care and personal support care. Um, so the momentum is there right now. I think this is a, a moment to be heard right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're all, um, you know, speaking from the same songbook finally. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a matter of decision making and priority making. And uh, yeah, there's been some great people leading the, the issue. Um. We're in early January of 2018. 2018 is an election year. Um, do you think this can become a major theme through the election? And do you think that makes any difference? <laughs> We've had all kinds of political conversations over the past 20 years about how to make the system better, but we're mm -hmm. still having this conversation we're having today. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're at a tipping point and would an election be part of that tipping point or would it be just another version of political party offering promises and then they go do what they do two years from now anyway. Mm -hmm. I hope it's a tipping point. I think it's a matter of making care, making senior care a priority. Mm -hmm. um, as you had said earlier about in New Brunswick having this unique opportunity because we're small and being creative, we can try new things. Um, they sometimes refer to New Brunswick being, you know, the the, the, not the fishbowl, but um, the, uh, a lab, a living lab. Uh, right. That's what it is, a living lab um, where we can try some unique, bold, creative things that will, will change. Um, but that, that's, that's challenging and, and it, it will take a politician or a political party who wants to be bold and creative, um, but one that um, really can't help but ignore the uh, gray wave as some people refer to it mm. um, because it's here and it's now and it's been here and now for a while yep. and it really would be a miss for any political party to dismiss it because there's more seniors in the province now than ever before yep. and we know those are the people that vote so and we know these are the people that are going to need care and they're going to want care and the baby boomers, of which are part of this um, booming population, mm -hmm. they are a little bit different maybe than their parents were. Whereas their parents might have been more, um, I'll take what I can get, I won't ask. Maybe if I don't <laughs> ask, they won't, you know, um, they certainly, um, and I think a part of that, it just from that um, generation, it's just, it is very much a generational difference. They grew up during a depressed period where they didn't have much, they didn't ask for much. Yep. Um, they took what they, what they, what they, <laughs> only what they minimally had to. Yep. Whereas this next generation of baby boomers are very different in the sense that they're knowledgeable, they're educated, and in some instances um, have the money to purchase services that they want and need. And so you can't dismiss them. So I think the government would be grossly amiss um, to, to ignore them because, and, and that's really um, 
is a motivating factor in my work because I do find that people want answers. They're demanding answers and they're going to demand services too. Mm -hmm. So we better be ready. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is lovely. Thank you very much. Because you're also mapping out that part of the solution has nothing to do with building more buildings. Mm -hmm. It has to do with investing in people mm -hmm. and, and nurturing a system of people that deliver the in-home care and the home health care. And it's what they want. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you listen to what people want, uh, the general desire is to be supported at home first. And they're going to be requesting other things too, not just in home care. They're going to be wanting access to ongoing education. They're going to be wanting mm. access to technology. They're going to be wanting all kinds of different things that are alive and well in their communities. So this is a this is a knowledgeable generation that's coming up. This this gray wave that's building. Mm. Um, yeah. They're gonna they're gonna be the real test. And we need to be prepared for that. And right now, we're very ill-prepared to support people at home. In, in support of that theme that you just offered on the gray wave, um, past conversations with past guests has to do with the narrative in New Brunswick around aging and aging populations. The guests, of course, were of that age, did not like the conversation and how it's framed very much because they don't want to be typified or characterized as a tsunami sucking up all the resources. Um, because yeah. their skill sets are, mm -hmm. uh, they're an unusual bunch this time around. Educated. And that they're coming through at a certain age window with a certain life expectancy that's changed, education level that's changed, socioeconomic status that's changed. And now a whole system has to try to catch up with mm. that, that piece. And we're so small that with any luck we can dance you know, pick up to the tune and start to dance rather than entrench and say, no, we're going to keep building uh, senior care facilities mm -hmm. instead of mm -hmm. adapting to what the real demand is. Yeah. And I, and I really, um, I don't like those references either, gray waves and the gray tsunami. I'll say it now only for the <laughs> sake of saying it, but I actually look at it um, really more for the opportunity that it does present. This is a, a an educated well experienced um, sector yeah. of people that are that are entering retirement and entering into their senior years and we need to engage that yeah. that's what the province could do differently as well is really engage all that knowledge we've got this collective mm -hmm. um, there's wonderful educated smart experienced uh, world traveled people in the province so let's engage them uh, in helping us to solve some of these issues I'd, I would never uh, dismiss them um, oh you're off to retirement good riddance goodbye keep riding the wave that's not it at all I, if anything it's an opportunity to bring them in as part of the solution mm -hmm. they're going to be the ones that vote and they're going to be the ones that could very clearly be part of this solution it's almost as if we're living in a window of time where the role of elder in white culture is finally starting to emerge. Mm. If we've started to use that language, that the role of someone with that much life experience, that much skill set, that much wisdom, start to have a voice in the conversation rather than um, how it's been framed to this point yeah, in time anyway. I think you're right. That's changed yeah. the notion of elder in, in our culture. I think you're right. Focusing back a bit on you a little bit, what's what's the piece of this work that you like the most? Well, I've really narrowed it down. Um, heading into year two um, of uh, owning a new business and 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 you know you're you're pivoting and trying all kinds <laughs> of different things. Yeah. Um, the thing that it's really boiled down to for me is supporting caregivers. And I realized um, that I do that in a lot of different ways. It could be by providing um, a live talk, like a public education talk, uh, and I've done several of those. It could be by offering a wellness expo, and I hosted one of those back in September, and it was great. Um, and there's one-on-one uh, -on -one with families where people really need some very individualized, um, very specific uh, help um, in their situation. So even though I do a lot of different things, it really does all boil down to supporting caregivers. And that is why um, the second job, as I refer to it, that activist work that I do mm -hmm. in trying to enhance the home support, the personal support worker sector, the two are so closely related. I can't turn my back on a sector that I worked in for 20 years um, because I know the 
ins and outs of that industry, but I also know how much that um, sector, those, those personal support workers, help uh, family caregivers. Really, they work together side by side. And in um, family caregivers rely very heavily on having good, competent, quality personal support workers. And it breaks my heart, honestly, to see them go without care hmm. because they're trying to work. They're trying to look after their mom and dad. They're trying to maintain doctor's appointments. They're trying to upkeep their own health. Some of them still have kids in high school and university. It's this whole sandwich generation. There's our next generation that we're going to be talking about. <laughs> yeah. And they really need support. And so the two really go hand in hand. But it really does for me. It, it, I've, I've been really laser focused the last year. And I realize that it really does all boil down to supporting family caregivers. Those that are supporting, caring for an aging loved one. Somewhat related, have there been many changes in technology or science and medicine that you've noticed in the time that helps with the home health care part? Oh, there's all, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, as far as like technology, uh, like things that are available for people, yeah, there's, there, there's everything. There's, there's devices that, um, I mean, the, the devices that some people know about, like the lifeline buttons that people fall, the I've fallen and I can't get up commercial that some people remember. Um, there's, there's definitely the lifeline gadgets, but, um, the, the medical device, um, uh, um, uh, fall detection devices, they actually can serve other roles too. They can remind people to take their medications. Uh, they have voice prompts that come in that tells you it's time to take your medication. Um, there's even dispensers that will, on a certain time code, dispense the medication. There's nanny cams uh, for people that maybe are hiring in-home services, but they still want to keep it, you know, have a visual of what's happening um, at mom and dad's house. There's all kinds of applications now too. And there, there's been a couple that have been um, in the development phase here locally, actually. Uh, some applications uh, for your phone, whereby you can log on and see what's happening with mom or dad. So you could be living in another province and log on to your app. And if, if it's all connected through each phone, then you can you can see different uh, things that are happening with your parents. So. You mean like literally see? Well, what? if you had a, one of the cameras, Camera set up? yeah, like some people refer them as nanny cams, okay. um, but where there is an actual monitoring device. So if you're concerned about your loved one roaming or moving around at night or right. getting up um, or maybe having had a fall, then you can visualize it on your phone. Yep. There's all kinds of technology. And on the flip side of the technology is that there's all kinds of technology support now for seniors to learn about how to use it. And I know that you had Sally on your show and yeah. talked about um, DigiLearn and all the great work they're doing. So yeah. it's just ev it's just everywhere. And um, it just adds to some of the supports that can help uh, a caregiver, especially if you're a long distance caregiver. And that's a reality in New Brunswick, hmm. because a lot of the sons and daughters, um, they all got educated and some of them got jobs and moved away. Yep. And so I know some of the caregivers that I've spoken to have been as far away as Switzerland, Japan, New York. Um, they just don't live in New Brunswick anymore, but they are their parents are still here and they still have some connection to the community. And so um, technology like that becomes... Um, well, it's, it's just a, a win-win for them yeah. because it just gives them an added peace of mind. Yeah. yeah. Thoughts for what you think people should know when they get started with all of this. So mm. um, there, I just did the um thing. <laughs> so when people uh, are looking to first enter the system and they'll catch what they get in the news, which mm. isn't necessarily helpful for, <laughs> or for mm. them sometimes, or they'll make their first call to social services or the Department of Health or their family doctor. And then they're trying to muddle through. Is there, mm. you know, it's just a little tidbit or a hint or a tip that you could give them about don't worry, it'll work out or, mm -hmm. you know, just, yeah, it's, just it's, that first wave because it's, it's like learning a whole new language. All of this is coming at you at a time when you're not completely in crisis, but you're feeling the impending mm. 
edge of a, a crisis if we can't get action in a certain time. Yeah, overwhelm is very real when you're dealing with issues with your loved one. It's obviously very emotionally charged. Mm. It can't not be uh, when it's your loved one. Um, even if your relationship with your parent hasn't always been a good one, um, sometimes that actually makes it more challenging because it becomes more emotionally charged. Um, a word of advice that I would give to people is, is not to lose themselves in the whole process. I find that uh, some caregivers can become so intent on resolving every issue that comes at them from a caregiving angle that they really forget about themselves and um, they end up with some compassion fatigue or complete burnout. So in a lot of the work that I do on my social media, it really is to try to um, provide that motivating factor that really is required um, to know that you're not alone, um, that it will get better, um, to focus on what you can change, not what you can't change. Um, just some motivating um, pieces because it can become really draining really fast. So I would, I would encourage people to not lose themselves in the whole process of it. Um, but knowledge is power. And I, that would be the second thing would be about getting educated. Um, but the amount of information that's out there can be overwhelming. And so uh, you have to be really um, selective because your situation is very unique to you and it's very select. Um, there's no shortage of information on senior care, elder care, care for the disabled, community care. It's everywhere. It's coming at us, radio, TV, internet. It's coming to us from friends, neighbors, ev everyone and everywhere. Um, there's no shortage of information. It's how do I narrow that down into what I need, very specific to what I need. We haven't touched on the financial stuff very much. Um, mm -hmm. Could we explore that a, a little bit? Typical of the pattern, oh, I think I need some help, and how much is it going to cost? So can we wander mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. your perspective and your experience what the financials are like for people needing home health care? Sure. Or for, let's see if I can explain this well. Um, for those that have saved well and are prepared to spend, um, services can be purchased. If we're going to talk about in-home support from a personal support worker, um, you can purchase those services if that's uh, the route that you choose to go. Um, if you need financial subsidy to help pay for that, then you would apply for government subsidy through social development. But yeah, it can get costly. If, if you're looking for in-home supportive help, um, you're probably talking in the range between 20 and $25 per hour. And if your parent needs, I'll, I'll go really small and say three hours of help a day, which is relatively small, um, then you can see how that would add up fairly quickly. And one of the challenges sometimes in working with our seniors is that they don't want to spend. And that goes back to that generational difference that going through the depre uh, depression and saving well and and um, keeping their money uh, not wanting to spend it and so um, they may not want to purchase the care so they'll sometimes go without and then on the other side with social development they may not want to divulge any of their financial information in order to go through the financial assessment process so <laughs> there can be some challenges in that area um, when you're working with your loved one because of may maybe one of those situations but it can get costly and the most that would ever be subsidized by the province in new brunswick is about eight or nine hours a day so if you require more than that then you would have to look at the next um, step which would probably be like a supervised care facility like a special care home so unless you can um, finance all of your home care yourself and there are some people that are in that unique situation um, then the most you'll ever be subsidized by the province is up to eight or nine hours sometimes they'll if they feel it's to the benefit they'll look at each case individually but i doubt you would ever rarely see more than nine hours a day approved so if you need more than that, then you have to look at a different option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it does get expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In your experience, have you found um, people have been able to get through the process 
and get results. Again, media tend to report it in the negative. Uh, all, I always <laughs> all the frustrations and this isn't working, and yeah. but we never hear the stories of where it did kick in, mm -hmm. where the services were great, um, mm -hmm. the expenses were covered. I always used to say, and I still say it today. I just said it last week. Um, when it works, it works. When you have that great combination of um, well trained, well qualified staff working with clients who whose care needs they're able to manage and care for when the family's contributing when the care workers are working closely together um, it can flow and it can flow really well and it can work really well i've seen many clients many family situations where they've been supported at home and it's just worked those people have stayed out of the hospital they've been taking their medications they're as healthy and well as they can be in their community still involved in their community still out um, uh, doing things that they would like to be able to do and I, I do believe that a lot of that is the supportive care that they're getting so when it works it works and it can work really well keep mm -hmm. people out of the hospital and keep people from falling yeah. key key thank you for watching be good have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. <laughs>